Hello, screenwriters, and welcome to Writing for Screens, the screenwriting step-by-step -step project, episode number 168, session 168. My name is Glenn Gers. I come to you every Monday through Friday, if I can make it, at 3 p.m. Pacific Standard time zone to let you look over my shoulder, share my screen as I write a script. And I am doing this in order to teach a part of screenwriting that I think is underserved, which is the process, the step-by-step, day-by-day, page-by-page, scene-by-scene, line-by-line work you got to do to make a mess of ideas and feelings and hopes into a script, a Thing that somebody can read through from the beginning to end and follow a story. I think that any kind of script, no matter how great you want it to be, if you can't actually get it written, turn it into scenes with characters, it's not going to be great. So I am just letting you watch me walk through the process in case you can pick up some things that are helpful to you when you are facing the blank page. Think of it as just tools and skills that you can use. I'm going to try and show you as I do them, kind of like a cooking show or Bob Ross of screenwriting, just showing you some tricks and techniques that you can apply to your work because everyone is different. Every writer is different. Every project that every writer does is different. I can't tell you how to do yours. I can just show you some things that might help you. That's what we do here. Uh, hello, this is Kitchy. Hello, Natasha. Um, so, yeah, that's what we're going to do. Um, if you are watching this for the first time, you do not have to watch all 168 of these things. Just drop in when you feel like it, pick up some tips, bop around. It's all good. There is no great unified lesson here. It's just watch the work, talk about the work. Uh, okay, so let's get to it. Hello, Pedro. Um, we are going to get to work because we are making progress going through the draft. Um, <laughs> I'm my own kind of Bob Ross. Uh, for one thing, I'm not as calm as Bob Ross. Bob Ross exuded a, a Buddhist existential calm that I so admire. I am more or less uh, the Marty Scorsese of screenwriters, <laughs> talking a hundred miles a minute and referring to things that only he understands. Uh, thank you, <laughs> Jackia. Nice to see you. I am glad. I don't think uh, I have seen you before. Have you been here before? Um, hello, Division 5. Okay. So, um, where are we left off? Uh, we, we, uh, what I'm doing is I'm going through a rough draft. I had a 94-page rough draft, uh, and it was just uh, the first exploration, the first taking the outline and writing the roughest crudest, best I could version of it to get it on the page. Because until you have it on the page, you can't make it good. So now I'm going through it and saying, A, what is this scene really about? What really has to happen here? What are these people doing? What is the one thing more than anything else that I've got to get done in this scene? And then uh, just cleaning it up, shortening it, making it precise, making it work dramatically. Uh, so we're going through it page by page. We have gotten down to 71 pages. My goal is 60, but honestly, page count is not what it's about. I'll figure that out. The important thing is to make each scene work. Um, yay! So welcome. So glad. Uh, it is great to have you here. Please feel free to ask questions as I work. I will get to them as soon as I can. Um, so, I don't even know what probate is. I don't even know what probate is. No, I don't even know. Okay. Um, wow, riding, riding horseback. <laughs> Are you riding on horseback or about horseback, Bruce? Very nice to see you here. Thank you in Nebraska. Um, hi, Gene. Hi, hi. Um, where in Nebraska? Uh, I went I went through the bottom of the state. I was from Lincoln uh, all the way uh, across the bottom, and it was 
gorgeous. Uh, Lincoln, I particularly liked. Hello, Tavana. <laughs> okay, uh, let me let me get this going. Um, I don't know. I'll be back to. I, oh, I'm just trying to clean up this dialogue. I don't know. I'll be back tomorrow. Uh, when you're writing dialogue, it is very helpful to read it out loud, to play it. You don't you don't want to get it so that you're writing something that only can be said the way you think of it, but you do want to get a flow of it, see if things are flowing, talkable, speakable, uh, sensible. All right. Um, I don't know. I'll be back tomorrow. I don't know. I'll be back tomorrow. No, I, I can't. I can't let this. No, I don't know. I'll be back tomorrow. I can't let this take over my life. Yeah, let's let's take over. No. Uh, I don't know. I'll be back tomorrow. I can't let this take over. I don't know. I'll be back tomorrow. It, it's a whole. It's a whole house. It's a whole house. It's a house. It's a whole. It's a whole house. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have. I'm going to ha have people come and box it. I'm going to have people come and box it all up and take it away. All right. That's what we're going to No. No, I'll be back tomorrow. I can't let this take over my life. It's a, it's a whole house. I don't know. It's a whole house. It's a whole freaking house. It's a whole damn... It's a whole... It's a whole damn house. It's a whole... House. I don't know. I don't even know what probate is. <laughs> Have you submitted the work stuff? Um, now, this is something you should know. If you're working and like you have characters who are in a specialized field, like in this case, she's uh, she works in data analysis. Um, you can just write like work stuff, and then later. When you're doing a pass where you're dealing with just technical, detail-y kind of stuff, you can do some research or some thinking and figure out what work stuff is. Um, I, I once worked on <laughs> uh, writing an episode of Grey's Anatomy, uh, which didn't get filmed, but gosh darn it, it was a great experience, and they were really nice. And one of the things I found out is very often the writers will, will say like, uh, okay, and then they'll just put in parentheses, medical, medical. <laughs> like, like, be sure to get the medical, medical here. Because it's just like, I'm going to have to talk to a medical expert about what kind of, uh, you know, surgical thing or, or procedure or equipment is, is here. So you just say, like, be sure to bring back the medical. <laughs> and then put it in parentheses. And then later they'd go by and talk. They, they'd, they'd go through it with the medical experts, which they had on the staff, um, some of whom were actually the writers, which is great. Um, Anyway, so now and then, if I have something technical to deal with, like you know, on the Wall Street scenes or something, I'll just write, you know, work stuff, and I, and I'll go back later when I'm focused on that. Because right now I'm making this speech, uh, making this speech work. That's the real thing. So, for instance, the point here is that in this thing, she say they've asked her a question about how she's going to handle having inherited her ex-husband's stuff, and she says, "I don't know." So she listens, and then she says, I don't know. I don't even know what probate is. Have you submitted the work stuff? In other words, she's taking, she's turning the subject back to her job, her life, that sort of thing. Damn it. Oh, hey. I got to go. My dinner's here. My dinner's here. I, I got to go. I've got to go. Um, hi, Rachel. Hi, Dan. Good to see you all. Um, okay, so... I'm gonna have... I'm gonna have to get... I'm gonna have to get people to come box it. To get people... Sometimes you got to add, I'm going to have to get, 
I'm going, I'm gonna, gonna, I'm gonna have to get people to come box it all up and take it away. it all up uh okay hmm. all right for the moment that's it um this is a little too practical really because what i want to do is express her frustration not her actual planning people come deal with this we have to get people to come deal with it deal with it To get people to come box it all up. Yeah, that's not, that's that for the moment. I don't know. All right. Oh yeah, my dinner's here. I gotta go. I gotta go see you tomorrow. All right. Is the intent of the scene apparent right from the outline? Are you still figuring out what some of these scenes need to mean? Uh, no, uh, pretty much the outline has been uh, like. The things I figured out in the outline are actually what they are about. The trick is, I will like I, in this case, in the one we just did, um, I knew that I th there were so many. I put down a bunch of things. She was the point is I needed her to be talking to her office. That was actually the main function of this scene to express her desire to get out of there and to to uh, point out that George's life is not her main focus. Her main focus is getting back to her own life. So that was that was the point of the scene. The problem is when I wrote it, I wrote like 50 different things, like the details of how she was going to get stuff packed up and stuff. And so what I was doing now was more refining it to actually make the point that I intended originally. Um, what I think I'm doing now in going through this pass is I know what I think the scene should be about, but when I wrote it, I didn't get that to work. So now... I'm sometimes rewriting, sometimes sharpening uh, or emphasizing, but in general, and sometimes it's like I knew she had to talk to her office, but I didn't know exactly what her attitude was. So um, very few of these are actually changing the intent of the scene. The outline was solid enough on that score. It just wasn't very um, sharp. It wasn't very precise and specific. And one of the things about screenwriting you have to do is as you go on, you have to get more and more specific, more and more concrete and specific. And it's this thing does this thing, that thing does that thing. And the more that you make each thing do its own thing, the better. Um, as as Sidney Lumet wrote about directing, but I think it's true about writing too. Um, if you think about it as a mosaic, in other words, each it's a picture made up of, of, of a thousand little tiles, little squares or shapes, each one of their own color. And that, that one, its job is to be yellow, to be a certain yellow and to be a certain shape. And then you put that next to a slightly different yellow and then another slightly different yellow. And then pretty soon you get a, a tone for the whole area. And then you get a whole picture. But each piece has got to just be itself. Um, that is very much the, the mosaic theory is, is really an accurate description of what the job is. Okay. Door. Late teens. Okay, for instance, here, this is, you know, local sandwich shops. This is a lot, but it's also really good because it is specific. The thing is, it's wearing a local sandwich shop's logo printed apron. Apron, cool. But it says Ziggy Sandwiches, so I can take sandwich out here. Local shops, logo printed apron. Yes, 
thank you, Cash Works, 1905, uh, which is not a year, it's a it's an amount. <laughs> Uh, okay. Uh, you know what? She notes his gaze. There we go. Um, uh, Return, you see, I don't want to over, like, takes the cash from her wallet. There we go. As Madeline takes the cash, takes the cash from her wallet, Kyle checks the place out. She notes his gaze. He shrugs, busted. That's what we're talking about. Um, because the truth is, when they're when they're actually doing it, this is really important that you understand. The way I described that originally, she was going to go find her wallet and then come back with the cash. And while she was away, he was going to do that. He was going to look around, and then she was going to see him when he gets back. That's actually like five steps. And the director is probably going to say, "Have your wallet in your hand, get the cash out," because they are going to want the scene to happen in the moment and not this stepping away, coming back. So if I'm over directing it by saying, oh, she does this and then she does this and then she he does and he does that, that's the kind of thing that messes up. It, it, it over complicates the read and it's not how they're going to do it. So don't try not to over direct. Try not to direct when you write. Um, the point is Kyle's checking the place out and she catches it. I love this. <laughs> Controls the urge to correct him or hit him. Yes. Yeah. Poison, right? Money. Uh, I was using the word cash, 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 and then down here, trading the bag for the cash. That's cool. So here, I just claim it money just to make it a, a better read. That's important. Let's take out. <laughs> this is just a joke. It's just a like, yeah, duh, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to eat here. Uh, You his mom? <laughs> Ex-wife. Oh, wow, you must be. <laughs> I'm not. Like, you must be all broken up. I'm not. Pissed. Oh, maybe. No, I'm not. I don't know what I am. Sucks. <laughs> it's, I'm beginning to like Kyle. Uh, once I figured out that Kyle was doing these one-word, really short things, it's what he was like. Chaos. Chaos in cheap sneakers. It's what he was like. Chaos. Chaos in cheap sneakers. And I like this too. Uh, this is sort of a snazzy, like he's not managing to leave. Basically what I'm saying is he's, he's trying to figure out how to, to bring up this new topic. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. When we were together, yes. I meant, do you want some? I meant, do you want some? <laughs> oh, 
I sell some stuff that's not on the menu, if you know what I mean. I do understand. I just thought, you know, take the edge off. What makes you think there's an edge? <laughs> And then that, that's good. This is see, this is a good scene. Uh, I can't, I can't fault this. This is going to play lovely if they can take all this time for this scene because it's a good scene. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so, and then we cut to later. on the reel-to-reel -reel tapes box. This is just smooth. There's an excellent sound system. Recorded in the mid-90s, Val and George with their punk grunge band. Hands rolled on the reel-to-reel -reel tapes box. The death of music as we know it. You know what? I am not going to center that. I am going to... Uh, Let's see if they'll let me, if the software will, yes, that is not bad. Boom, okay. Back in the night, in the... Madeline George with her punk rant in the mid nineties. Don't need to say recorded. the excellent sound system. Alan George, there. Okay, we know it was the mid-90s. Boom. And it's also punk grunge. What else? What else would it be? Okay. Um, sings as loud as she can with her 20-year-old self. Cool. Cool, cool. Cool, cool, cool. As they say in community. Uh, all right. Let's see. So, so this now reads better than it did. Just simply cleaning up the read. Music blasting on the excellent sound system. I on George. And they're punk back. They're a punk crunch band. Hand scrawled on the reel-to-reel -reel tapes box. The death of music as we know it. That's just pretentious enough to be right. Madeline sings as loud as she Do I need, yeah. Do I want to say stoned? Yeah. Just in case somebody didn't understand the cut. Okay, so. So far, so good, folks. We are making progress. We are not cutting, but we are just getting it to read well. Okay, so now it's dark. It's dark. Now we got a window barrel. Windows, windows. And a mouse. Watch as the house. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> cool, cool, cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a good show. Okay. Um, Danny Pooty. Um, all right. Parked across the street in the dark, watches the house. He frowns, rolls down the window. The blasting music drifts out to him. That's not, he's in. Where? Oh, wait. This is interesting. Exterior George's house. I was, I was picturing this as interior Dandowski's car. Interior Dundaskis. Does he have a car or a truck? Pickup. Continuous. And this is continuous because it is the same time just outside. Lit. 
I do like that. Watch as the lid up has. The problem is I'm afraid that that will sound like it's on fire. Uh, okay. Drifts in. There we go. Gets out of his exterior, George's house, George's street. Do we have George's street? No, we don't. Okay, so we're going to do George's street. <laughs> this is good. I'm trying to glimpse the party in this house of grief. Not far down the street. Now, do I want to say, so this is one of the things they stop a block away and go out. Big lurking figure. I'm, I'm capitalizing some stuff to try. The thing I'm trying to do is just keep it flowing, keep the story. This is this is storytelling mentality. Storytelling. Uh, okay. Devana's got a question. How one of two? Nice. How could someone go about writing a romance in love when the story needs it, but the writing is clueless? In my story, there's a clear space and desire to build that kind of relationship, but I am grossly repelled by romantic comedies and cheerily poorly written. Well, I, I mean, to a certain extent, the answer is don't do that. <laughs> don't do the thing you don't, you do like and not the thing you don't like. Um, there's, there is no rule that says writing romance and love has to be uh, cheesy and poorly written. Write it. What do you think is good? Write what you think is good. That one's easy. That one's easy. You know, there's no, there's no rule that says writing romance and love has to be any particular way. Um, in fact, the you know the the secret is you're not watching enough good stuff, or you're not watching enough stuff until you find something you think is good, because there are some uh, pieces where the romance is so understated and and you know, sort of off kilter that you, you know, you could put your, your finger on any particular romantic line. And yet because of subtext and because of, of action and dramatic, uh, the way that people express things, you may get a great romance. Um, you know, that's, that's a tricky thing, but I, I think the big, the answer is if you're repelled by romantic comedies, well, first of all, are you writing a romantic comedy or a romance? Because if you're writing a romance, you don't have to worry about romantic comedies. Just ignore them. And, and the main thing I would say is name for yourself. Uh, and I do this, by the way, I, uh, if you recall, um, I do this in the overview. In the overview document, which I urge you to make. Uh, hold on. There we go. Um, here at the top, uh, I've got my little, I've got a, a sort of quick summary, a, a one-line pitch of what it is. And then I have models, things this is ideally going to be like. I wrote that for you guys. <laughs> I knew that I would just do this. Um, but, um, and then I have a bunch of things that I, I love and I admire. And I think, how can I make this like them? And very often they're very different. Um, you know, I mean, um, <laughs> blood simple and charade are very, very different. Charade is, is Audrey Hepburn and, and 
Cary Grant, a sophisticated Paris pseudo Hitchcock in the 1950s, maybe 60s, uh, early 60s if so. Blood Simple is uh, the Coen brothers' first very dark, low-budget noir set in Texas, West Texas, I believe, and it's a story about a bar owner and his wife and and the or, ornate horrors that happen when people start to suspect that they are cheating. Um, anyway, the point about this is these models, the, what you do with those is you say, I'm writing romance. Well, think about the things that you think are good romances. You, you've And if you've never seen one, then that's cool. But then you need to define in this document what is a good romance. Um, like here, like I'm saying, what do they want? I, I ask myself the big questions, you know, and then I wrote down here, this story is a cascade of fumbles. The characters are all making mistakes that force them into conflict. In other words, I'm trying to, um, and it's, it's a team of loser stories, but not that simple. So what you should be doing is saying, it's a romance, but... And, and try not to define things negatively, but not cheesy. I don't know what that means, because things that you think are cheesy, I may just love. So what I would say is define what is it? Is it that it's uh, realistic about the difficulties of communication or about uh, the, you know, the, the what, what about romance do you find uh, grossly repellent <laughs> and cheesy? Um, and so I would say the answer there is, um, if you don't if you don't like it, don't waste your time telling yourself and everyone else what's wrong with theirs. Think about what's right with yours, because that's what you have to write. You can't write the negative of someone else's. You have to write what's good in your view. So that's my answer. <laughs> uh, hi, Kirby. Um, the writer is clueless. Well, I mean, which writer? You know, unless, unless you mean yourself, um, in which case, get a clue. Think about what either why do you want to write about romance if you're clueless about romance, or if you think other writers are clueless, what's the clue? What do you know that they don't? That's what you want to do. Um, okay. Yes, charade is awesome. Charade is one of my, if I had to have a top 100, because <laughs> um, I can't even imagine a top 10. But, but in among that top 100, charade would definitely be there. Um, do, is that helping you, Tavana? You can tell me more about what, what's, what's, A, what's good and what's bad and what, you know, what you're trying to define. But my main answer is it's on you to, to do the thing that you think is good and not even think about, you know, like, oh, well, romantic comedies are all this. Well, they're all that until someone does something different. Uh, you know, at the time that the uh, British invasion of romantic comedies led by uh, Richard Curtis with Four Weddings and a Funeral um, and, and later Love Actually and Notting Hill. By the way, I think all of those are stunning. Um, but anyway, if you hate them, cool. I don't mind that. What I'm saying is that until that kind of romance happened, there were very different romantic comedies happening in America. So... Um, What's romantic comedies? You know, is it, you know, Sandra Bullock and, and Matthew McConaughey, Kate Hudson and Matthew McConaughey? Yeah, I'm not a biggest fan of those, although some of them, you know, they can be OK. Uh, it depends on it depends on the writing. It depends on a lot of things. Um, what ingredients are missing from the previous recipes? Science here points out. And I assume that that, that is a, a, a suggestion for you, not a question for me. So I'm going to just pass it on to you. What, what Science here is pointing out is if you don't like previous romances or romantic comedies, then you have to think, what is it that you like? What ingredients are missing from their recipe? And you make that. You cook that up, um, he said. Uh, okay. Um, Dan, I see your question. Hang on. I'm not going to do it right now because I should write a little bit more and then I'll do it. In the early days of writing... Was there a TV show? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll do that in a few minutes. Um, okay. How to write new rom-com. Okay. So, like I said, I just want to get a little bit more flow here, a little, like, 
tension and and uh, uh, just a good good story. So we've got he. Dund I'm going to call him Dundaski here, and the reason I'm doing that is because it's George's street. And subliminally, although I don't think that people really spend too much time reading these things, the slug lines, I believe you should write, assuming that nobody is reading the slug line. But um, just to be sure, I'm going to say Dundaski gets out of his truck so that nobody thinks it's George. Um, walking closer, trying to glimpse the party in this house of grief. He doesn't notice headlights approaching down the street. Yeah, no comma there. Approaching down the street. And go out. Ha ha ha. Suspense. Uh, Norman studies the lit, lit up house, the truck park nearby. And um, actually, we don't need the truck park nearby because Dundaski's already over there. It moves into the dark. Moves into the dark, heading to the back. Heading to the back of the house. Cool. Uh oh. Okay, <laughs> he takes his phone from the magnetic dashboard grip. Who cares? He dials 911. <laughs> There we go. Um, all right. I would say Notting, I mean, yes, you could call Notting Hill a guilty pleasure. My definition of guilty pleasure is something that, that you genuinely think is bad. Um, however, I genuinely think that's good, so I wouldn't say it's a guilty pleasure. That's just a pleasure. Um, you being the clueless writer, you did help. I haven't seen one that I like. And also, thank you, sir. You haven't seen one that you like? Not one? All right. Well, that's actually cool. If you haven't seen one that you like, there's two things I would suggest, because this is interesting. Clueless writer. Um, you're not clueless writer. You're a strongly clued writer. You know what you want. Uh, well, the key here is, A, if you have not seen a single story that portrays romance the way you want, uh, you can sort of do a, a, a process of elimination. What's like define for yourself what's wrong with the ones you have seen and and get the most egregious things wrong because uh, otherwise you waste your and then specifically figure out what you would do that's different and then do that that's the key <laughs> you know it's it's just so damn easy to be a critic and I uh, but to actually solve the problem creatively. That's the writer's game. That's where you have to be really good. So you have to say, I hate all these things because, and you have to think about why. Why do I actually hate them? Like, what's wrong with them? Because it's going to seem so natural to you to say, oh, that's wrong. But in truth, first of all, some people may like it. And also, why? What about it is bad to you? But then you have to turn that into what would be good. Because you don't write anti-bad. You write good. <laughs> I think I'm gonna make that into a uh, like a, a T-shirt. <laughs> you don't write anti-bad. You write good. You write the good thing. You write the thing that you want to read. So that's your task, Tavana. Think about what in relationships is not being portrayed and how you would portray it. <laughs> um, you know, uh, the thing I will say about guilty pleasures is that the, there are some where it's guilty pleasure is a social construct, <laughs> because what you're really saying is, I know you guys hate this, but I like it. <laughs> That's what guilty pleasure really is, is I recognize that there is a some some consensus of, of disliking this thing, and I can't entirely disagree, and yet I like it. That's the definition of guilty pleasure. Otherwise, there's just, you're wrong and I'm right. Hey, you think it's bad, I think it's good. Uh, that's different from guilty pleasure. There is guilty pleasure. There's things that I just like, I can't recommend this to anyone, but I like it. I would say a good 50% of the things I like 
are guilty pleasures in that sense. And some of them are, are it's not all that they're trashy. Some of them that they're so artsy that I can't in good conscience recommend them to anyone. Um, but, but I like them. Uh, okay. Yeah. 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 All right. So, The. Look at that. I cut a line. Uh, see, the main thing is you want it to read smooth. You want it to like just keep moving. Don't go. Don't, don't get jammed up in the words. This is nice. Um, oh, and this is something that a lot of people ask about. If you're intercutting, like I am intercutting several things here. We're starting, we start here on inside Dondosky's car. He rolls down, the, he hears something, so he gets out of the car. So now we're here at the exterior, and then he starts towards the house. Then we're intercutting him with Norman, who's watching him. So that's this section. And then we're intercutting that with what's in the house, which is mad, singing and dancing. And then when the song ends and the noise stops, which was allowing Dundaski to come around, we cut to him. And then cut to this. So that's intercutting action. And the... Um, the, the main thing about intercutting action is that um, when you do that, generally the best way to do it is not to write intercut or anything because this is far too complex for that. Just do the cuts and do, do these. Uh, I would say when you're intercutting a lot of different action, you want to get that flow. The main thing is keep the text short so that we're not getting stuck in one place. We're recognizing the rhythm of the of this, the motion of our mind. That's the rhythm you want to talk about. It's not the edits. It's the, their mind is here. Now it's switching to him. Now it's switching to her. Now it's switching to him. That's, that's where you're trying to steer. It's story rhythm. Um, yes, Freud actually discussed that. Um, and <laughs> Freud and South Park. And how often do you get to say that? <laughs> um, Well, that's true, but once, yeah, 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 uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to get it. What all I'm going to say is remember in all, in all of our lives, I would say it is really important to remember that the artist, the good artist, I believe, is the one who's constantly saying in the midst of negative thought, in the midst of criticizing others to say the actual job is being positive. It's not what's wrong with somebody else. It's what's, what's right about what you're doing. Every time you spend time dwelling on somebody else's failings, you are being a, an audience and a critic and not a creator. A creator is worried about making theirs good, not telling us how somebody else is bad. I feel strongly about this, although lots of writers are energized by their rage at other artists. However, I will say still, I like to constantly be thinking, A, what's good about a thing I'm looking at? Even if it's terrible, what's good? And second of all, what am I going to do? And what I'm going to do is going to be creative. It's going to be inventive. It's going to be positive because you can't create a negative. Okay. I love this. Um, you know, we're going to know. No, it has to be a recorded voice. Um, either that or I just don't call it a 911 operator because that's the trick. Um, What it really is is phone tree. 
Yeah, you know what? I'm just going to take 911 operator out because that's it. Okay. And is that worth doing? Yes. Every letter, every word that you can take out of the audience's eyes so that they are seeing less words, so that the words that they're seeing are more valuable, it's worth doing. Phone tree. Uh, that's what we'll do. We'll put the speaker here. Yeah, it's pretty obvious if it's on phone and we said it was on speaker, I don't need that other sentence. Uh, okay. Please choose from the following options. For fire, press 2. For medical emergency, press 3. For police, press 4. <laughs> he still presses 4. Eyes on the house. And agonize them. Yeah. I think just another one. You know what? We don't even need that. <laughs> as soon as anybody hears, please listen here carefully because our recorded, because our menu has changed, we know. So this now, this reads better than it did a minute ago. And all I did was cut some crap. Okay. Ah, <laughs> okay, hangs up. Sometimes you say hangs up. I mean, the thing about hangs up is hangs up is from the day when you had the thing that you actually hung up on the little cradle. The, the handset went on the cradle and it was hanging up. Now you push a button, so you're technically disconnecting, not hanging up, but hangs up. This is this is not bad. I, I wish it, it's it's reading better. It's reading better. That is the game sometimes. Flips. Threading a new tape. I am capitalizing randomly. Um, the thing about capitalizing randomly, I'd like to talk about for a second. Capitalizing randomly is a screenwriting perk, <laughs> which is there is no reason to capitalize this in that's logical. I just feel like I'm trying to focus the mind and, and agitate the like, tenseify it a little. So what I'm really secretly doing is implying a little bit of close-up, showing her doing that and then going out. But just by um there's something about the capitals here that is rare. One of the rare advantages of screenwriting is you are allowed to do this. You have to establish for yourself as a style. Um, there are some scripts where I just don't do it. It's like, I will not use that cheap trick <laughs> because that's what it is. It's a cheap trick. It's, it's essentially shouting at the audience or, or forcing their face up against uh, a, a word. Um, however, I am going to use it because it is a commonplace among screenwriting. Um, it is not in any way defensible. It used to be, I believe, back in the old studio days, they had some system where you capitalized props or location. I don't know. Whatever it was, it's long gone and nobody has. And there is no rule or logic to the emphasizing capitals. The closest thing you can come to, um, the closest thing that you come to it is in comic books, they will bold words 
for just no reason, not even emphasis. They'll just like, bah, <laughs> bold. So, uh, so yeah. Yes, little by little, a big difference in the flow. Thank you, Gene, for backing me up on that. Um, okay, here's the thing. She's threading a new tape. She finishes threading a new tape and flips. I guess that's too, because it's finishes and flips. You try and keep your verbs in the same tense. Madeline finishes threading a new tape into the machine and flips a clunky old lever. So her action is finishing and flipping, finishes, flips. Cool. Uh, these are things that actually happen subconsciously. I'm saying them out loud to explain to you, but you should be likewise doing it because it sounds right. There's something wrong if she says, finishes threading a new tape into the machine and flipping a clunky old lever. The reason that that doesn't work, no matter how many P's they put in there, is I'm she's finishes threading, and then I match that to flipping, but that's wrong because the action is actually finishes. So that is how you do grammar without knowing grammar. I do not know proper grammar. I learned a little bit of it in the 1970s in high school and promptly forgot whatever I learned. Uh, what I do know is if you read a lot, you absorb the proper use of language. And by proper, I do not mean formally right. I mean the good use, the, the, the readable use. The more you read, the better you'll write. I am going to make that into a thing. Hold on. The more you read. Ah. <laughs> Uh-oh. Turned it into a... Uh, hold on. Oh, hush up, phone. The more you read, boom. The better you write. Okay. Bing, bang, boom. Look at this. We're making it big. Uh, and we're actually going to go out on this because this is super important. I cannot emphasize this enough. Um, uh, the more you read, the better you write. The way that you can learn to be a good writer is to write a lot and read a lot. Read, read, read. The more that you get the, the way that words can be used by people who have spent a lot of time thinking about it, you absorb it. it it's like living in a city and learning the language. Uh, so I just I just say, you got to do that. You, if you want to be a good writer, it is almost impossible to, to be a good writer without reading. It is possible to be a good screenwriter and just watch movies and shows. Um, because you're kind of reading with your, your watching, but, um, but read, read, read. I, I'm telling you, the more you read, the better you write. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, I, uh, this is true. I have read, I have read that used it. Um, the character's first appearance. I am big on this. I believe that when you introduce a character, you capitalize and bold. Um, but I, I'm just, you know, like, so if, if there was a new character coming in, the, you know, Smedley, the lawyer, um, I would actually bold that and capitalize it comes to the door. Okay. Uh, that, that's how much I want you to see new character. Um, is that a rule? Is that a universal? No. Is that the only way to do it? Absolutely not. That's what I say doing, it, though. That's how I say. As for the props thing, who cares? Seriously. Yes, I do believe that they did props in like 1952 <laughs> when they had like a studio script department. Um, but then I got to say, uh, props, nobody is uh, using capitals to emphasize props. That was when you were working for a company, okay? You wrote scripts because you were in the script department. And you had to go at nine and you literally had to punch in like a factory worker and sit in your little cubicle and write scripts. That's when you did the, the props thing. You don't do it now. Uh, that is, yes. Um, okay. 
That would be city police or county sheriff, which would be, hi, Nick, by the way, nice to meet you, uh, city police or county sheriff, as in here. Oh, Oakdale County Police, city. Ah, okay. Oakdale County. Hmm. That's a good point. Um, how's that? Sheriff. Feel better, Nick? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's uh, Nick Nick knows stuff uh, and he's right. Um, okay, county sheriff services. I do not know about, and I'm trying. I was trying to decide how large a city um, uh, George lives in. That's why I was hesitating over the count the city county sheriff police. That is a cool point. Um, okay, it is seen as poor form not to capitalize character names. Because I don't want to. Um, nah, I mean, you know, um, poor form, kind of, but not the end of the world. If you don't want to, you don't have to. <laughs> uh, tell him I said so. Um, honestly, the, the problem is you do want to in some way bring out, make visible that you are introducing a character. It's just how people are trained to read. So if you don't do it, you may slightly confuse them. Um, read a lot and then read some more. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there we go. These are, these are my tips, but my main tip, and I cannot emphasize it enough, the more you read, the better you write. Um, and tomorrow... We will do more of this uh, this this scene because this scene is getting good. I, I'm I am I am getting to where like there are certain parts of this where I'm like, oh, that's actually done. That's actually like within a a, a little polish of readable of of a script of good stuff. So uh, so who to thunk that would have ever happened? Okay, it's uh, time to go. I will see you tomorrow. Go write something.